And just like that, there she is. Boom. Um, I believe a boo is in order, but I said boom instead of boo. So you know what? That is what is happening today. Um, so I guess I just got the notification, like just now, like two seconds ago. Hello, everyone. While I was going live, that uh, it's having issues st streaming to Facebook. So if anybody's trying to watch this on Facebook, apologies. I will try to go fix it later um, to see if I can upload it there. I may have to like do some, you know, magic IT shit on my end to try to get it to like come up correctly. But otherwise, it is working perfectly fine to YouTube. We're just gonna go with it because I'm like I. I don't have time to just to navigate out and like repost it and like meh. So um, yes, welcome, welcome, welcome everyone who is here. Welcome. I know it's been a minute, but it is time. It is time, my children. Uh, welcome back to your last highway. Your your last highway. Blah, blah, blah. Let's try that again, shall we? Rewind, reverse. Thank you. Welcome back to your last exit on the highway to hell, the dead hours. I am future ghost with the most and the attendant of the gas station of the damned, Vivian Noir, that's me. Um, and this week, um, gather around my children, my sweet summer children for the tale of Jack, the rippingest ripper who ever ripped Victorian London. And if you couldn't tell my by my gratuitous uh, use of the word ripper, yes. This week, we are discussing the granddaddy of famous serial killers, the OG himself, Jack the Ripper, himself or herself. There's some theories on that. That'll be in episode two. So we'll get into that a little later. So Jack the Ripper terrorized the East End of London from August to November of 1888. Uh, his primary targets seemed to be prostitutes who are working in a mile area around the districts of Spitalfields, Aldgate, and perhaps most famously Whitechapel. Um, as well as in the city of London proper. I'm actually going to share a map with you guys quickly so you can get an idea of the area we are working with. So those, um, as you can see, it's not like a very wide area. Um, they were within a mile, like central. So could make sense that it was somebody who lived in that area. So all the red dots obviously are the murder victims slash suspected victims. We'll get into that too. Um, but the guy liked uh, liked hanging out in certain neighborhoods. That is for sure. Uh, he had his preferences and it was not a great area of London at the time. Um, it was a pretty low income area. So there were a lot of, you know, prostitutes, working ladies, unfortunately for the pickings. So, um, he was known at the time before the famous letters came out, which we will actually hear performed by a very special guest who I'll let you guys guess who it is, uh, during tonight's broadcast, uh, before the famous Ripper letters, before he, he gave himself the nickname, Jack the Ripper, uh, he was known as the Whitechapel murderer or leather apron, which I have to say, I like Jack the Ripper probably the best out of those, he probably looked at the paper and went, leather, no, what kind of, what kind of horse pucky ass nickname? So he was like, I gotta come up with something better than that. Otherwise I'm be known as the fucking leather apron who forever. Um, so let's get into it and start unpacking, shall we? There's a lot to unpack here. Okay, it is. Like, it is. To fully understand the scope of Jack the Ripper's crimes, we need to understand the workings of Victorian London at the time. To say it was harsh living conditions for the poor was an understatement. The poorer areas of town, mostly on the East End, were not much but crowded, filthy tenement buildings where the lower classes sought to scratch out a meager living. The streets were dirty and rat infested. The air was rank with desperate poverty and women who were still treated much more like cattle than actual people had to do what they could to get by, which a lot of the time in these crime ridden streets meant turning to prostitution. Also, the uh, side note, the streets were not only rank with poverty, but were rank with just the stink of 
fucking Victorian London at the time, which people would still, you know, the sewage was not great. It was not a very clean area of town. There were a lot of rats. People didn't use deodorant, didn't bathe regularly. I'm gonna let that juicy image just sink right on in. So <laughs> these streets were probably pretty gross and pretty terrible. Like I cannot imagine trying to, uh, you know, life was hard enough at the time without, yeah. And then it was, yeah, no, mm -mm. people were like, oh, would you ever want to go back in time to some period of time? People were like, oh, I'd love to go back in time. To I was like, no, no, no. Maybe you want to think about that because you're wanting to go back to a time prior to regu having regular plumbing and pre hygiene. So when you go back there, be prepared for when you step out of the time machine to immediately vomit over the stink of uh, rotting bodies, BO, and piss and shit in the streets. So have fun with that. Enjoy. I want nothing to do with any of that. Thank you very much. Hard pass. It was a hard life for many, and it was about to get even harder. There was no concrete way to estimate the actual number of Ripper killings. Some estimate only four, and some estimate as high as 11. For the sake of this episode, I will be discussing the five generally agreed upon victims known as the canonical five. So there are estimated up to Ripper scholars have kind of agreed, have definitely agreed on the canonical five being the main five victims of the Ripper, just because of the letters and the notifications tied to them, the patterns. Um, but there are other outside victims. There was one that was in August. So when I said he started in August of 1888, there was one um, that was prior to that. So she was around that time, but she's one that's people debate on. Uh, they don't, some people think she was the first victim other Jack the Ripper scholars kind of debate that. There were also two supposedly after the last one that are commonly believed to be uh, Ripper victims, but were, it was another one where they, it's a lot up for debate. So the first one that could have been in August was Martha Tabram. Nobody can really agree on the fact if she was or wasn't. She was in the area, the injuries and the wounds that were the same. Um, as well as Alice McKenzie and Francis Coles, who were 1889 and 1891 after the last canonical victim. Um, so those are the most likely possible victims. But unfortunately, as you know, there is no way to tell for sure. They are suspected to be three of his other victims, but we will only cover the main five today. That's a lot. And, well, we'll get it. You know what? No, we'll start now. <laughs> I was like, in this slideshow, I did include some graphic photos. So, um, if your thing is not graphic post-mortem photos, maybe, maybe no, maybe this, maybe this while it's happening. <laughs> maybe, maybe don't look. You can just listen to me and pretend it's a radio show. The first victim discovered on August 31st, 1888, was Marianne Nichols. Nichols had been born Marianne Walker on August 26th, 1845. She was known as Polly. At the time of her death, her age was estimated to be between 30 to 35 years old by the East London Observer, but her father at the inquest said, quote, she was nearly 44 years of age, but it must be owned that she looked 10 years younger, unquote. Nichols was a woman of slight build, being barely over five feet tall. She had a dark complexion, her brown hair was peppered with gray, and five of her front teeth were missing. She was described as having small and delicate features, high cheekbones, and gray-colored eyes. She had a scar on her forehead from a childhood injury. She was described by Emily Holland, a former roommate, as a, quote, very clean woman who seemed to keep always to herself. She was also an alcoholic. Between 3.40 and 3.45 a.m., Polly Nichols' body is discovered in an area called Bucks Row by Charles Cross, a man on his way to work. He calls over Robert Paul, who is also on his way to work. Come and look over here. There's a woman, Cross says to Paul. Paul believes he feels a faint heartbeat. He says, I think she's breathing, but it is a little if she is. 
The two men agree they don't want to be late for work. They rearrange Nichols' skirts, which had been pulled up to give her some decency, and alert the first police officer they meet on their way. In the meantime, though, Nichols' body has been come upon by another police officer, PC John Neal. He signals to another officer, PC Thane, who joins him. So um, when Charles Cross and um, Robert Paul came across uh, Nichols, her skirts were raised almost over her waist. So they thought at first that she might have just been passed out drunk. So they kind of pulled her skirts down to kind of, you know, give her give her some decency. And then they were like, oh, she might be dead. Um, it was dark in the streets and they kind of like figured, I guess they did what they could do because Paul, Robert Paul suggested that they try to get her sitting up, that they maybe thought she was passed out, but Charles Cross refused to touch her again because her hands, I guess um, her face was warm, but her hands were cold and limp. So he was freaked out, understandably so, and did not want to touch her again. So they were like, well, we're in late for work already, which sounds really fucked up. <laughs> like we found this dead woman. She might be dead on the sidewalk. Oh fuck. Look at the time. Like I, <laughs> if there was ever a better reason for being late for work, I think finding a dead bitch in the street is a pretty good one. Um, no, my grandmother died. My puppy got sick. No, I literally found a dead woman in the street. I think I need to call out. Like, I mm, I have heard less reason. Um, so they didn't notice. What they didn't notice was that um, her throat had been cut. So I don't know if it was dark at the time or they just kind of just didn't get a close enough look at her to notice that her throat was cut. So that wasn't discovered until the um, police officer show up, which they do shortly. The two were soon joined by PC Misen, the officer that Cross and Paul had encountered. PC Thane calls for a doctor, Dr. Reese Ralph Llewellyn. The officer returns with the doctor a few moments later, around 3.50 a.m. During a coroner's inquest, it was found that she had been strangled and then had her throat cut so deeply that she was nearly decapitated. The eight inch long incision was made with a long bladed knife, moderately sharp and with great violence. There were no other injuries on the body until around the lower part of the abdomen where several violent wounds had been made. Two or three inches from the left side was a jagged wound. It was a very deep wound and the tissues were thoroughly cut through. It was determined that the horizontal cuts had been made from left to right and were done by a left-handed assailant. Okay. What? Okay. Yes, Jack the Ripper was left-handed. Does that <laughs> does that mean all left-handed people are a little crazy? I don't know. Maybe left-handed here. So uh, I don't know. But there were also um, people were like, "Oh, well, how didn't anyone hear anything? What what happened?" It's like, okay, well. There were witnesses at the time. Um, so in a, an adjacent street, there was a large uh, horse slaughtering yard where three men were working throughout the night when she was murdered. They said they didn't hear anything and knew nothing of the murder until uh, the cop, PC Thane, passed by to go get the doctor. So they came around to review the body and kind of looked and they found themselves under suspicion but they were eliminated as suspects. Uh, they were also joined at, the, joined at the murder site by Patrick Mulshaw, who was a night watchman. He was working at the nearby sewer works. He did confess that he sometimes fell asleep on the job, which I mean, honest. Okay. Uh, and he was, but he was emphatic that he'd been awake between three and four, which they're, they think is when, uh, it happened, or at least he would have heard something, but he said he didn't hear or see anything suspicious. But around 20 minutes to five, a passing stranger told him, watchman, old man, I believe somebody is murdered down the street. And he immediately went around to where the body was. The police then made attempts to trace uh, his mystery informant, but never did find out who that was. So the Ripper did not strike again for seven days. His next victim, Annie Chapman, a.k.a. Dark Annie, was discovered on September 8th, 1888. Annie was born Annie Eliza Smith in 
in September 1841. She was also a bit on the short end, being exactly five feet tall, but was, quote, strongly built. She had a pale complexion, perhaps due to malnourishment and her suffering from tuberculosis. It was also said that she perhaps had syphilis and was likely dying. She had dark brown wavy hair and blue eyes. And while she had a drinking problem, she was not described as an alcoholic. She had married later in her life to a coachman named John Chapman. They had been separated by 1844, 1885 by mutual consent. A police report claimed it was due to her drunken and immoral ways, but the real reason is unclear. John Chapman sought his former wife by paying her 10 shillings a week until his death on Christmas Day, 1886. It was said that after that, she cried and seemed to give it away altogether. She didn't take to prostitution until after John's death. At around 1.35 a.m. on September 8th, Annie returned to her lodging house. She didn't have the money for her room for the night, so she said she wouldn't be long in getting it and leaves. At 5.30 a.m., Elizabeth Long sees Chapman with a man. They are talking. She hears the man say, will you? And Annie replies, yes. Annie Chapman had been facing Long, but the man she was speaking to only had his back to her, and she could make out no features. A few moments following the Long sighting, a young carpenter named, named Albert Kadash, living at 27 Hanbury Street, walks into his backyard. A five-foot-tall wooden fence separates his yard from 29 Hanbury Street, the very house that Elizabeth Long had seen Annie Chapman speaking with the mysterious man at. Kadash hears voices quite close, but the only word he can make out is a woman saying, No! He then heard something fall against the fence. Annie Chapman's body was discovered a little before 6 a.m. Her left arm was placed across her breast. The legs had been drawn up with the feet resting on the ground and the knees turned outwards. So before we get further into that, um, prior to this, I mean, Annie Chapman was having kind of a rough go of it. She was kind of a nomad. She um, had been living at different lodging houses and she, the last lodging house she was living at was at number 35 Dorset Street. And she, I guess, had a pretty cordial relationship with the other people living in the house and the deputy keeper, uh, Timothy Donovan, who said she was like a nice lady, but she just drank too much. And she supplemented her meager income that she obtained from crochet work and making and selling artificial flowers with prostitution. That was very common at the time for women that were like widowed and in a bad way. And uh, it was one of the few ways women could actually make money back then. And she had two regular clients who would see her a lot, two regular Johns. One was known as Harry the Hawker, which I have to say, like <laughs> Harry the Hawker. All I picked, I know that means that he sold stuff and that he would hawk goods, but all I can picture is just somebody walking around coughing all the time, just like a really like nasty, like juicy cough, like and just spitting out loogies all the, like, it's not a pretty picture up here in my brain. Um, it's gross, just gross. The other man was uh, named Ted Stanley. Uh, a, he was a retired soldier, supposedly, and he was known to her fellow lodgers as the pensioner. Um, but as it transpired, he was neither of those things. And he was a actual laborer, a bricklayer, who lived at number one Osborne in Whitechapel. And he would come by and frequently spend like Saturdays to Monday. So like spend the whole weekend with her at the lodging house. And he also claimed that Stanley had told him to turn Annie away. Should she ever arrive at the lodging house with other men? He then vehemently denied that fact and claimed to have only been there once or twice, which, <laughs> okay, dude, whatever. So that was the only trouble that they could really remember her having like getting into prior to her death was that some stages within the month or two months before there was an argument at the lodging house where Eliza Cooper, who was, I guess, another um, that Harry the Hawker was the catalyst in all of this, that according to Eliza Cooper's inquest testimony, she had loaned Chapman a bar of soap, which Annie had then given to Ted Stanley, the pensioner, who then went to wash with it. And over the next few days, she asked her a couple times to return the soap, only be, to be like dismissed and like, meh, like, uh, meh, whatever. Who on one occasion then contemptuously and kind of snarkily tossed a haypenny onto the lodging house table and told her to go buy some more soap. 
and was basically like, bitch, I gave my mans the soap. Here's a penny. Go buy fucking some more soap. So it, she did not like her at all. There was, this was a fight, a, a cat fight, a Bruin. And I guess the women met a few days later at the Britannia pub on the Eastern corner of Dorset street. However, on this occasion, Annie Chapman slapped Eliza across the face screaming as she did. So think yourself lucky. I don't do more. Eliza retaliated by punching Annie in the eye and then hard across the chest. Uh, Annie seemed to be the one who was worse for the wear in that uh, exchange of blows because I, apparently those bruises were still evident when uh, Dr. Phillips carried out the postmortem after she was murdered. And yeah, and she was her health wasn't great either. Um, so yeah, it was just not, <laughs> take this soap and put it in your ass. Here, sink wash your junk. Like I'm guessing that's I I would be like the here sink wash your 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 shit. So obviously they don't think it was the woman that did it. They just kind of got in a fight and that just happened to be. I mean, it was just a a a large play out of like how this woman's life was basically just going to pot up until she got murdered. And then it's like, and then, oh, murdered on top of all that. So her face was swollen and, and turned towards its right side. The tongue protruded out between her front teeth and it appeared to be swollen as well. She had not been dead long enough for rigor mortis to have set in, but the doctor who attended the body post-mortem took note that it was beginning to set in. The throat of the victim was again cut very deeply from ear to ear. The cut was so deep, in fact, that there were two distinct clear cuts visible on the spine itself. The incision was again made from left to right. The instrument that cut the throat, which was again estimated to be a long, sharp knife, was also used to make cuts on the abdomen. So they actually even said that when the body was found, it was found with this handkerchief tied around her throat. She had been wearing it when the killer cut her throat. And it had not as often, it, I guess, people claimed that the killer tied it on to keep her head from rolling away. Um, that was not the case. That was, she was already wearing this handkerchief and it actually was cut through. Um, and her cut, her again, her throat was cut so deeply that there were marks on the vertebrae, that there were, it went all the way through to the spine. So that's a, you have to cut through a lot to get that far back. Just throwing that out there. That is just physics. That is just murder physics. Hashtag murder physics. The doctor who performed the initial examination, Dr. George Bagster Phillips, noted that the knife may have been something like a bayonet or something similar to the leather trades as an ordinary surgical case might not contain an instrument long enough. He also indicated that the killer seemed to have some anatomical knowledge. The mutilation of the abdomen, though, is where the killer truly put his talents on for show. It had been entirely laid open. The victim's intestines had been removed from the body and placed on the shoulder of the corpse. While from the pelvis, the uterus, ovaries, along with the upper portion of the vagina, as well as two-thirds of the bladder, had been entirely removed. No trace of the missing organs was found. What? I want to know what kind of wet sample fucking Pokemon collection this guy was making just to, to abscond with organs. To abscond with organs and they were never found. And that is not the only victim that they had missing organs from that the organs were never located. Guy went to town. Went to town. Um, Dantex, a surgical knife, it could have been, although the doctor at the time seemed to think that this knife was too long for that, that the knife was about a 14 inch long knife, which would have been, it wouldn't have been in every surgeon's kit. It could have been. And like, maybe um, if you were looking at a military surgeon or something like that, where they would use those to cut off limbs um, for uh, amputation, something like that. But this is not going to be a knife that a typical physician or doctor or surgeon at the time is going to carry around um, with him at, at all times. Now, of course, not every person is just going to butcher somebody on the street and steal their vagina and their ovaries either. So obviously dealing with a little bit of a different soul here, a little bit of a different dude, just, uh, um, and that's one of the theories also as well that it was could have been somebody with military experience, either somebody with surgical uh, from the military 
with field dressing and field surgery or a butcher was another theory. Um, we'll get into the theories on when we do the suspects, which will be episode two, because there's a lot of suspects. Some of them are ridiculous and some of them are pretty like, I don't know. The incisions to remove them had been cleanly cut, avoiding the rectum and dividing the vagina low enough to avoid injury to the cervix. This was where the doctor saw the work of an expert or someone who had a decent amount of experience in anatomical or pathological examinations. Which there's your counter argument for somebody that was militarily trained, possibly. Um, I could see that as being a counter argument of somebody that's like, okay, well, if you were trained in the military to do field surgery, field dressings, amputations, chances are pretty good that your knowledge of female anatomy is not going to be great because you probably studied it in school, but had no actual field experience. When you're cutting off limbs and cutting up soldiers in the battlefield, uh, none of them are women. So this had to have been someone that was either possibly a mortician or somebody who did postmortem stuff who had experience varying to different genders as well um that is my theory i don't know i didn't hit play the killer had struck again and while police sought to find a suspect it didn't seem to take long for the suspect to seek out the limelight himself on september 27th a letter was sent to the central news agency Originally deemed to be just another attention-grabbing hoax at the time, it wasn't until three days later that the Dear Boss letter was deemed important enough to be reproduced in the papers at the time. Mainly because it contained a promise that the killer made that was fulfilled by his next two victims. Dear Boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. I have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the right track. That joke about leather apron gave me real fits. I'm down on whores and I shan't quit ripping till I do get buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and I want to start again. You will soon hear of me with my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in the ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, but it went thick like glue and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope. <laughs> The next job I do, I shall clip the ladies' ears off and send to the police officers just for jollies, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work. Then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp. I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind me giving the trade name. P.S. Wasn't good enough to post this before I got all of the red ink off my hands. Curse it! No luck yet. They say I am a doctor now. <laughs> the okay, pause for a second. Yes, that is that is Polly who is in the chat. Um give him kudos please it was a very a last minute i kind of asked him to do it last night and get in the lines until like like the 24th hour but he did a fantastic job on really short notice um really creepy really creepy well done uh and this is also the first instance the dear boss letter is considered one of the legitimate letters because there were so many fakes and there were so many hoax letters going around at the time. This is considered one of the genuine letters sent from the killer. Um, you'll notice that the penmanship is very good. It's very steady. Um, keep that in mind for when we get to one of the later letters. And um, this is also the first instance where he gives himself the name Jack the Ripper. So up until this point, he was called the Whitechapel Murderer or Leather Apron or the Whitechapel Fiend 
like the Penny Dreadfuls had given him all these different names and then he called himself Jack the Ripper. So this is the very first instance of that being used. Also pay attention to the part with the ears because that will come into important play in a little bit in the next murder. Letter was reproduced in hopes that someone would recognize the handwriting, but the attempt came too late to save Catherine Eddowes and Elizabeth Stride, who were both murdered on the same night, September 30th, mere blocks from each other. Elizabeth Stride, known as Long Liz, was born Elizabeth Gustafdotter on November 27th, 1843, in Sweden. She was 5'5", and at the time of her death, she was 45 years old. She had a pale complexion, light gray-colored eyes, and curly dark brown hair. All of the teeth in the lower left side of her jaw were missing. Lodgers in the home where she stayed described her as a quiet woman who would do a good turn for anyone. At 11 p.m. on September 30th, two laborers were going into the Bricklayer's Arms pub on Settle Street. I Pause for a second. I don't know if a good turn for anyone was oh, she's a nice person and she would do whatever, you know, if you needed a favor done, she would do that for you. She'd like give you the shirt off of her back kind of thing. Or if that was people being shady going, yeah, she'd do a good turn for anyone saying that basically she's a hoe. I don't know. Like it's, it double-edged sword reads two ways. Just saying. As they entered, they saw Stride leaving with a short man who had a dark mustache and sandy eyelashes. He was wearing a billycock hat, a morning suit and a coat. He seemed respectably dressed. He was hugging and kissing Stride in the doorway of the pub for some time. The two laborers tried to get the man to come inside for a drink, but he refused. They then called to Stride, that's leather apron getting round you. The man and Stride moved towards Commercial Road. At 12.35 a.m., James Brown says he sees Stride with a man as he was on his way home. She was leaning against the wall, talking to a stoutish man around 5'7 in a long black coat that reached his heels. He had his arm up against the wall, and Stride was saying, no, not tonight, some other night. At 1 a.m., Louis Deemschutz, a jewelry salesman, entered Dutfield's yard with... So before that, rewind a little bit. Before Deemschutz steps into the picture... Um, William Marshall then also saw Elizabeth Stride around 11.45 p.m. Uh, he was a laborer who lived at 64 Burner Street, and he was standing outside, and he noticed a man and a woman standing outside at number 63. He said they didn't seem drunk. They both seemed pretty sober, and he watched them start to make out and kiss or whatever. And then Marshall heard the man remark to the woman, you would say anything but your prayers, which is, I don't know. <laughs> Dude, if that's a come on, that is the worst fucking come on I think I have ever heard in my life. Because that makes you sound like a fucking psychopath. Like, a no who talks like that? Who talks like that? You would say anything but your prayers. <laughs> like, get, ugh, ugh, no, get out of here. So then they moved off uh, in the direction of Dutfield's yard, which is where Louis Deemschutz steps into the picture and continues his cart and pony, but the pony stopped at the entrance and refused to proceed. Deemschutz assumed that something was blocking the path, but could not see as the yard was completely pitch black. He used his whip to probe forward into the darkness and made contact with a body, which he initially believed to be blacked out drunk or asleep. He entered the building nearby, the International Working Men's Educational Club, to get some assistance in rousing the unresponsive woman. He returned with two other men, Isaac Kodas Broski and Morris Eagle. It was only then that they discovered Elizabeth Stride was dead, her throat cut. It is widely believed that Deemschutz's unexpected arrival frightened off the Ripper, who was then forced to flee before performing his signature mutilations. Deemschutz himself stated that he believed the Ripper was still in the yard when he arrived due to the body being warm and the odd spooked behavior of his pony. Dr. George Baxter Phillips, who handled the Chapman and Kelly murders previously, also performed. This is probably a really inopportune time for a joke, but I can't let it go. They also questioned the pony to see if he saw anything, and he said nay. <laughs> and goodbye, I'm leaving. <laughs> the postmortem. Oh, yes, that is really her. That is a. Uh, all of the photos that you have seen. Um, Hold on one second. I have to go back and find the comment. Yes. So all the photos you have seen currently of um, 
these these types of photos are actual photos of the victims. These are actual post-mortem photos of the victims there. So yes, I'm glad you all liked my horse joke. It was really dumb. <laughs> it was real, real dumb. Um, but I was like, uh, I was like, I can't let that one slide. There is no way. Um, it was 1888. This was all 1888. And you can see, like, if you look at the photo closely, you can see the cut across her neck, um, where again, it starts from left to right, the right side of the cut being much more shallow. Um, and the left side of it being the deeper. So it's like he started on the left and drug it this way, but like almost kind of like ran out of like steam and was like, I'm doing almost damage here. And then kind of like either he heard something, which there was a police officer in the area that says he may have seen her um, or saw a man. He did see a man that was, um, his name was, PC William Smith at 12:30 a.m. He noticed a man and a woman on the road opposite to Dutfield's yard. So before she is found by uh, Deem Schutz, he says the man was about late before his 30s, um, dark complexion, dark mustache, and it's interesting because they're seen at least five times. Like she has seen with this man in a dark overcoat, about five seven, five eight. Um, dark mustache. They're seen multiple times, but almost like the description varies in his clothing. Um, Cause they're like a dark coat. And then he had a dark hat. Oh wait, he had a hat that looked this way and he had a hat with a different peak. And it's like, um, so the couple wasn't really doing anything strange and the cop just moved on. Um, but yeah, apparently there was, been crazy things so the yard where Dutfield's yard was pitch black and maybe that's why he chose to walk her there um because there was no light but the wound in the throat kind of in indicates that maybe he started to do his thing and heard a noise or somebody he heard the cart he heard Deem Schutz's cart or his horse come up and like stopped examination of Elizabeth Stride. The body was laying on the near side of the yard with the face turned towards the wall and the feet pointing towards the street. The left arm was extended and there was a packet of cashews in the left hand. These were pills used by smokers at the time to sweeten their breath. The right arm was draped over the stomach. The back of the hand and the wrist were stained with clotted blood. The legs were drawn up with the feet close to the wall. The body and the face were warm, but the hand on the stomach was cold. The legs were noted to be quite warm. Stride was wearing a silk handkerchief around her neck, which Phillips determined had been cut from a visible tear in the fabric. The cut in the scarf corresponded with the right angle of the jaw. There was a very clear incision on the neck. It was about six inches in length and two and a half inches in a straight line below the jawline. While the right side of the cut seemed more superficial and trailed off towards the end, the left side of the throat was where the deepest part of the cut was. The carotid artery, a main conveyance of blood, had been partially severed. Unfortunately, it would seem that the Ripper wasn't satisfied with his first victim that night and decided to take a second. So before we get into the second, because apparently as he was interrupted and didn't get to do what he really intended to do to these victims, because um, that was his, you know, his, uh, his modus operandi was apparently to yet again, play fucking gotta catch them all with women's organs. Uh, he didn't get to do that because somebody stumbled on the scene and he barely got to slit the throat like he wanted. And so he did go off to find another victim. Um, it didn't take long. It was like maybe, I think it was like 30 minutes later after uh, Elizabeth Stride was found that they found the second victim, which was only a few blocks away. Right, modus operandi, it's great. Latin's amazing, love it. Kind of wish it wasn't a dead language. It's a language of demons and legal matters. And I don't think I've really put it into phrasing like that before, but honestly, like, yeah, demons speak in Latin and lawyers. I'm just gonna leave that parallel there. So um, 
when Elizabeth Stride is found, um, she was basically kind of laid down. There was nothing amiss with the body either after the fact, either with, with the other women, it seems like maybe they were posed post-mortem or their clothes were rustled and like undone or skirts pulled up. She was just kind of laying almost in the way that she would have fallen or as if somebody like slit her throat and just like laid her down. Um, the second victim was not as lucky. Going to give you a graphic photo warning on this one. We'll just leave it at that. Catherine Eddowes, AKA Kate Kelly was born on April 14th, 1842. She was around the same height as the other victims standing at five feet even. She had hazel eyes and dark auburn hair. She had a tattoo in blue ink on her left forearm bearing the initials TC in remembrance of a former lover, Thomas Conway. At around 8 p.m. on September 29th, PC Lewis Robinson comes across Eddowes, who is surrounded by a crowd outside 29 Aldgate High Street. She appears to be blacked out drunk in a heap on the pavement. PC Robinson gets her to her feet and brings her to Bishopsgate Police Station. They leave her in a cell to sleep off the drink until approximately 12.15 a.m. Kate is heard singing softly to herself in her cell. At around 12.30 a.m., she calls out to ask when she will be released. When you are capable of taking care of yourself, PC Hutt, who was on duty at the time, replies. I can do that now, Catherine says back to him. She is released at 1 a.m. and also, interestingly enough, gives the alias Mary Ann Kelly. That'll come into play later. It is estimated to have taken less than 10 minutes on foot from where she was to reach Mitre Square, where her body is later found. So we'll, that will come into play later with the final victim. Um, it, it's a really ironic twist of fate that she actually gave as her alias um, the name of the final Ripper victim. Or the final of the canonical five. So she's let out and she leaves the police station and she tells the police officer good night. And the hut, PC hut, who was the cop on duty at the time said it would have taken her around eight minutes of ordinary walking, not running, not speed walking, not power walking uh, to reach Mitre Square. So during which the time the murderer of Elizabeth Stride, whoever that was, was also heading to the square from the opposite direction. So unfortunately they would have like converged like this in possibly the worst, you know, wrong place at the wrong time situation since an iceberg met the fucking Titanic. So um, real fucking unfortunate timing. So um, Mitre Square where it was at, is situated half a mile west of uh, Burner Street. It just lay right inside the London uh, boundary. And it was in her patrol. It wasn't far from Aldgate High Street where she was found initially passed out drunk. So there were familiar neighborhood to her. She just basically went back to do what she was doing prior before she, you know, got, you know, <laughs> thrown in jail for being drunk. There's three entrances into the square, a fairly open wide one that came from Mitre Street, uh, the narrower one from St. James Place, and then in this uh, a long narrow church passage in the southeast corner. Uh, piece, uh, a policeman named PC Watkins passed through Mitre Square at 1.30 in the morning. And he's beat, you know, beat them being beat cops at the time and doing the, well, so this then, like that sort of thing. Um, he would pass through there every 12 to 14 minutes. So he had a lantern and he said that when he passed through it at 1.30, he had a lantern with him and he was emphatic that the square was deserted. Nobody was there and nobody could have been hiding from him. He would have not, he did not see anyone lurking at all in there. So bear that in mind which leaves a 30 minute gap from the time she steps out of Bishopgate Station to the time she is seen outside Mitre Square. At 1.35 a.m., Joseph Laudney, a commercial traveler in the cigarette trade, Joseph Hyam Levy, a butcher, and Harry Harris, a furniture dealer, exit the Imperial Club at 16 to 17 Duke Street. At the corner of Duke Street and Church Passage, they see Eddowes and a man talking. She is standing facing the man with her hand on her chest, but not in a manner to suggest that she is frightened or resisting him. 
Laudney describes the man as about 30 years old, 5'7", with a fair complexion and a mustache. He's of medium build and wearing a salt and pepper colored jacket, which fits loosely. He's also wearing a gray cloth cap with a peak of the same color. He has a reddish handkerchief knotted around his neck. Ten minutes later, at approximately 1.45 a.m., PC Edward Watkins comes across Edo's body in Mitre Square during his night patrol. So Watkins making his next round, which again would have taken him about 15 minutes. So the first patrol was at 1.30. He says nobody was there. There was nobody in Mitre Square. Nobody could have been hiding. He comes back around at about 15 minutes later, about 1.44, 1.45, and he sees Catherine Eddowes in a pool of blood and her clothes thrown up around her waist. And he runs um, into the warehouse nearby where there was a, a George Morris was a retired policeman. He was working as night watch. And he said to him, for God's sake, mate, come to my assistance. Here is another woman cut to pieces. Um, he, he pauses to get his lantern and runs out to uh, follow Watkins to the square to look at, uh, at the body. And then they, of course, then immediately summon a doctor and a police surgeon. Because this one, this one was bad. She unfortunately paid the price of his frustration. Dr. Frederick Gordon Brown, a London police surgeon, was called to the murder scene. He arrived at Mitre Square around 2 a.m. and determined that Eddowes had been dead only about a half hour due to the lack of rigor mortis. The face was quite mutilated. Both eyelids had been sliced through. A that is the understatement of the century. The face was quite mutilated. As you can see, this is an actual post-mortem photo. These are actual post-mortem photos of this, of this poor woman who apparently just ran afoul of the wrong fucking dude. Like, he seemed like he was trying to pick her up, and nope. Nope. She probably thought she found another John, and yeah, he wasn't. Spoiler alert! He was cut went across the bridge of the nose, and the tip of the nose was cut completely off. There was a cut on the right corner of the mouth, as if made by the point of a knife. The cut was an inch and a half long and ran parallel to the lower lip. On each side of the cheeks, there were triangular cuts that peeled back the skin. The throat was cut across from ear to ear, about six or seven inches. The muscles across the throat were cut clean through on the left side. The carotid artery was severed. The larynx was severed below the vocal cord. The cut on this side of the throat was so deep that it reached bone. The right side was less deep, but nonetheless, the jugular vein had also been punctured, but not severed completely. The cause of death was determined to be exsanguination from the left carotid artery. Death would have been immediate, and the mutilations were performed post-mortem, as there was no blood spray or spurting of blood on the bricks or pavement around. There was also no blood on the front of Edo's clothes. When the body arrived at the mortuary on Golden Lane, the clothes were removed carefully and a piece of the deceased woman's ear dropped from the garments. While Edo's face had been subject to the Ripper's knife-wielding rage, so had been her abdomen, much like prior victims. Her abdomen had been cut open from the breastbone down to the pelvis. Her intestines had been removed and placed over her right shoulder. Her liver had been stabbed and cut. There were several cuts and stabs to the groin area, and her uterus had been completely excised and removed. The left kidney had also been removed, and Dr. Brown determined by someone who knew the position of the kidney. You would also figure that between 1.30... When she is last seen and 145 or 140. So with, we're talking about a 15 to 20 minute window. Um, he would have had to do all of these things. So yeah, exactly. The mutilations they think were done. All, all of the abdom, ab abdominal <sighs> words. I can't do words tonight. Apparently uh, abdominal mutilations, like anything on the body, they do think was done post-mortem after her throat was cut because she would have died instantly. Uh, the carotid and the jugular were both severed. So she bled out like in a, a couple seconds. So there was no scream. Obviously when the throat's cut and the larynx is cut, the vocal cords are cut. No scream is coming out either. So he would have, had to have known something about anatomy and something about what he was doing or what he intended to do because he only had about 15 minutes 
to do all of this, to do all of the cuts to the face, to do all of the, like, I mean, cutting a person from here down all the way to the, to the pubic bone, that's not a small cut. And that's going to take you like a minute and not to mention pulling all the organs out and cutting the organs up and doing all these things. So he was a quick, he was a quick work. Like I said, that's what the whole, um, medical background kind of comes into play. Somebody obviously knew where to look for a kidney, you know, you, you know where to find that thing. So it cuts down on time cuts. Huh. That was an unintended joke, but, um, this one also, they did find a clue, which we'll get into in just a second. So does anyone remember the letter where he talks about, I'm going to clip the lady's ears off? That happened in this one. So when they get her to the mortuary with this, this is a post mortuary photo um, of her body, they uh, undressed her and a piece of her ear fell out of her clothes, which he did mention in the letter. So that's why they think the Dear Boss letter is a legitimate one. And we'll continue and we'll get back to the clue in just a second. On October 1st, 1888, another letter arrived at the Central News Agency. Actually, before we get into the letter, let's go ahead and get into the clue. So the area was crawling with police at this point. Um, the guy had murdered twice in less than an hour and this place was teeming with police officers. So he was pretty ballsy to just walk out of the, like, he just walked out of the square, took a, he must've known the neighborhood and must've been able to take back routes where he knew the police wouldn't go. Um, because there were, like I said, there were detectives already in the area. Um, they, one of the detectives um, finds, or a policeman finds on Goulston street, um, a piece of apron. So he walked past the doorway, which led to the staircases of 108 to 119 uh, Wentworth model dwellings. And he noticed a piece of apron lying on the floor in the doorway uh, on closer inspection. He noticed that the, it was covered with blood and feces and noticed other marks that looked like a, a blade had been wiped on it. So it's the only clue that's been ever left behind, um, which comes into play with some of the suspects later, but he, you know, hadn't seen, uh, the detectives saw nothing, saw nobody running, saw nobody fleeing, looking panicked, looking, yeah, a police officer. The um, This is where the the Jane the Ripper theory com also comes into play, where that nobody would have been looking for a woman. And plus, it would not have been odd for a woman who was a midwife or posing as a midwife to be covered in blood or have bloody aprons or things like that on herself. Same with a doctor, same with a surgeon. Uh, blood on their clothes would not have been out of place at the time so that it wouldn't have raised any alarm bells to anyone. But they don't, all of the officers in the area at the time, you have this net of people looking for this guy and he just, just slipped the net. Obviously wasn't panicked. Must have had a feeling that nobody was going to catch him. Either he, A, was confident that he knew of a back route to get around everybody, or B, he knew that, um, he was just calm and he's like, I'm not going to draw any attention because no one's going to even look at my ass. So let's get into the next letter. I was not cutting dear old boss when I gave you the tip. You'll hear about saucy Jackie's work tomorrow. Double event this time. Number one squealed a little bit, but I couldn't finish off. Not the time to get airs for police. Thanks for keeping last letter back till I got to work again. Jack the Ripper. This one, known as the Saucy Jackie postcard, makes direct reference to the Dear Boss letter, as well as to the murders of the previous night on September 30th. Those who argue for the postcard's authenticity point out the removal of Stride's ear and the fact that the postcard mentions the double murder before it was described by the press. Either way, the streets were silent for a time, but the pall of death hung as low as the fog over East End. The Ripper stories had become sensationalized in the press, and everyone seemed to be wondering when the next victim would turn up or if the authorities could catch up to him before then. 
On October 16th, George Lusk, the president of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, sort of an informal neighborhood watch, received a three-inch square cardboard box in the mail. Inside was half a human kidney preserved in wine, along with the following letter. Mr. Lusk, sir, I send you half the kidney I took from one woman preserved it for you. The other piece I fried and ate. It was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out. If you only wait a while longer. Signed, catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. Medical reports found the preserved half of the kidney to be very similar to the one removed from Catherine Eddowes, but findings either way turned out to be inconclusive. Obviously no forensics at the time, so there was unfortunately no way of DNA checking that piece of kidney. Um, that is the famous from hell letter. Um, and as you can see from the first letter and the second letter, the handwriting is markedly different. The, um, and even the spelling and grammar are markedly different from the first, the Dear Boss letter. So there is a theory in that there are two working theories. Either that the From Hell letter was a hoax, which uh, a lot of ripperologists, that is what they call themselves, do uh, put it in the hoax camp that Lusk was kind of like this guy who put himself up on a pedestal of saying like, I'm gonna catch the ripper. Me and my neighborhood watch are gonna catch the ripper. And people like didn't really care for this dude. So they think that there were medical students at the time that were like, we're gonna put this guy through his paces. Let's just see. So they took a piece of preserved kidney from the medical school and like sent this fake letter to him just to, just to twist this guy out. Um, you know, knock him off of his little <laughs> self-engineered pedestal or um, this was a genuine letter. And this was a, either a front of an intelligent uh, cunning killer who was trying to disguise his handwriting disguise the fact that it was the same person or this was the slow mental degradation of somebody who was actually going insane there are theories that um he could have been suffering from syphilis at the time or uh, some other mental illness and that's why he fit, had this fixation also on murder and prostitutes um so there's a lot of working theories about the from hell letter I tend to want to believe that it's real because it is my favorite letter, but I can see from the camp of like, okay, well, the handwriting's so different. The grammar is so different. Plus there were medical students who admitted that they had been sending letters. They didn't say they spent some of the uh, specifically sent the from hell letter, but they did say that they were like, yeah, we were kind of trying to mess with this dude. So I don't know. We'll let you draw your own conclusions on that one. The handwriting as well as the level of literacy in the letter is markedly different from the first two, leading some to believe that the famed From Hell letter was indeed a hoax. Police were receiving large numbers of hoax letters at the time, at one point having to deal with an estimated thousand letters related to the case. But perhaps the spelling and grammatical errors were part of a larger misdirection by an educated but deranged individual. Thousands of letters and leads were received by Scotland Yard, but no headway seemed to be made on the case. From varying and vague descriptions of possible assailants to the new press coverage of crimes at the time, the Yard always seemed to be one fatal step behind the Ripper. And while during October the streets had been tensely quiet, peace would soon come to its most violent and goriest end when the Ripper took his final official victim. Mary Jane Kelly was approximately 25 at the time of her death. She was the tallest of the victims, standing about 5'7", and stout. She had blonde hair, blue eyes, and a fair complexion. She was said to have been quite beautiful. Kelly was living with Joseph Barnett at the time of her death. Though they were simply roommates, Barnett would often refer to Kelly as, quote, his wife. She had been previously married, and when her husband was killed in an explosion, she moved to Cardiff, Wales, where she supposedly became a prostitute before moving to London in 1884. Point of order, um, your husband was killed in an explosion? Wow. That, I mean, that sucks, but wow. Like, 
I'm pretty sure you should get like extra kind of like widow benefits for that and be like, how did your husband die? Was it, was it the black lung? Was it tuberculosis? No, that motherfucker exploded. Give this woman all the benefits, all the money. Chop, chop, haste, haste. Her husband is in pieces, literal pieces. Like I was like, Expl okay, explosion. All right. She met Joseph Barnett, who was a market porter. People who knew them say that Barnett was kind to her and gave her money on occasion, which seemed to keep her off the streets. However, in August or early September of 1888, Barnett lost his job and Mary Jane returned to the streets in order to make money. Barnett decided to leave her then at the time due to the traffic of prostitution in and out of the house. Almost every day after the split, Barnett would still visit Mary Jane. On November 9th, he stops by between 7.30 and 7.45 p.m. He said she was in the company of another woman who lived at Miller's Court. He said she lamented the life she was living and wished to go back home to Ireland where her people lived. At 8 p.m., Barnett departed and returned to the boarding house where he played whist until 12.30 a.m. and then retired to bed. At 2 a.m., George Hutchinson, a resident of the Victoria Working Men's Home, returned to the area. He is walking on Commercial Street and passes a man at the corner of Thrall Street, but pays no attention to him. At Flower and Dean Street, he meets Kelly, who asks him for money. He declines, and she says she has to go find some money and walks in the direction of Thrall Street. She meets the man Hutchinson had passed earlier. The man puts his hand on Kelly's shoulder and says something which they both share a laugh over. Hutchinson hears Kelly say, all right. And the man say, you will be all right for what I have told you. Again, creepy. Who talks like that? Like, dude, are you, are you trying to get caught? Are you trying, actively trying to get nipped for being fucking creepy? Creepy. No. Blech. The man then puts his right hand on Kelly's shoulder and they begin to walk toward Dorset Street. Hutchinson notices that the man has a small parcel in his left hand. While standing under a streetlight outside the Queen's Head pub, Hutchinson finally gets a good look at the man who was accompanying Kelly. He has a pale complexion, a slight mustache turned up at the corners. He has dark hair and dark eyes and bushy eyebrows. He is wearing a soft felt hat pulled down over his eyes, a long dark coat, a white collar with a black neck tie fixed with a horsehair pin. He carries kid gloves in his right hand and a small package in his left. He is around 5'6 or 5'7 and about 35 years old. This guy got like a real good look to the point that he was able to describe the stick pin in his tie, which makes me think that this guy was like mm, a little fashion obsessed, shall we say? Like who, who notices that kind of detail? And the fact that he like trailed them and like he was like, I'm invested in seeing where this is going. What's that? They were giggling together. I must know. And he kind of like, it. it's never really explained as to why he does this. Because obviously he declined her. She asked him for money first. And he said, no, I basically, hey, I don't have any spare change. Sorry. And she was like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go find some money. And then meets this other guy. And they, they have a chuckle. And he, they start to wander off. And this guy's like, I have to see how this turns out. I'm like... But motherfucker, didn't you invite you in? Like, nosy, nosy ass. Okay. I'm just like, he got a real, like, the description was really good of this dude. More of the dude's clothes than the actual dude, though, to be fair. He's like, oh, he had kid gloves and he was wearing this and he was wearing that. And it's like, and about his face. Um, well, he had a face and he had a nose and I believe a mustache. But let's get back to the horsehair pin he had, okay? That was important. Kelly and the man cross Commercial Street and turn down Dorset. Hutchinson follows them. Kelly and the man stop outside Miller's Court and talk for about three minutes. Kelly is heard to say, All right, my dear, come along. You will be comfortable. The man puts his arm around Kelly, who kisses him. I've lost my handkerchief, she says. At this time, he hands her a red handkerchief. The couple head to Miller's Court. Hutchinson waits until the clock strikes 3 a.m. before moving on. An hour later, Elizabeth Prater is awakened by her kitten, Diddles, walking on her neck. She hears a faint cry of, oh, murder! But as this cry is common in the area, she pays no attention to it. The cry of, oh, murder is common in the area. What kind of backwoods, low-income, 
crazy crime-ridden neighborhood are you living in that people shout, oh, murder, and nobody responds? Like, people go, eh, fuck, not again. I'm going back to sleep. Like, I'm going back to bed. Like, murder, be quiet, bitch. <laughs> and it's like back to sleep. Like, nothing happened. Like, oh, okay. That's cool. But all right, that's fine. I don't know. Also, it kind of sounds like me with the cat wake walking across my neck, waking me up. Not like me. <laughs> no, be honest. Nothing more is heard from or of Kelly for the remainder of the night. The next morning at 1045 a.m., John McCarthy, the owner of Miller's Court, sends Thomas Bowyer to collect past due rent from Mary Kelly. Bowyer receives no response from knocking. The door was locked and he pushes aside the curtain and peers inside. Upon seeing the body, he informs McCarthy, who, after seeing the remains of Kelly for himself, runs to Commercial Police Street Station. Inspector Walter Beck returns to Miller's court with McCarthy. When police finally make entrance into the room, they find Mary Kelly's clothes folded neatly on a chair. Mary Jane Kelly had the worst mutilation and abuse from the Ripper to date. Dr. Thomas Bond, a police surgeon, was called in on the murder. His post-mortem his post -mortem report was as follows. Quote, the body was lying naked in the middle of the bed, the shoulders flat, but the axis of the body inclined to the left side of the bed. The head was turned to the left cheek. The whole of the surface of the abdomen and thighs was removed and the abdominal cavity emptied of its viscera. The breasts were cut off, the arms mutilated by several jagged wounds, and the face hacked beyond recognition of the features. The tissues of the neck were severed all around down to the bone. The viscera were found in various parts, the uterus and the kidneys with one breast under the head, the other breast by the right foot, the liver between the feet, the intestines by the right side, and the spleen by the left side of the body. So when I said graphic photo warning, I wasn't fucking around. This one is probably the worst one out of all of them. This woman doesn't have a face anymore. Like, this doesn't have a... She doesn't have a fucking face. At all. I... And then, yes, this is an actual photo. This is an actual photo taken at the crime scene. As you can see right here, right here, that is bone. That is her fucking femur sticking out of her leg. That is bone. Do you know how much fucking tissue you have to cut off? Skin, muscle tissue, to get to this. To this right here. It, and there's stuff here. And it was just like laid out like he was unpacking a fucking present. Just laid out on the body. The flaps removed from the abdomen and thighs were on the table. The bed clothing at the right corner was saturated with blood, and on the floor beneath was a pool of blood covering about two feet square. The wall by the right side of the bed, in line with the neck, was marked by blood which had struck it in a separate number of splashes. The face was gashed in all directions, the nose, cheeks, eyebrows, and ears being partly removed. The lips were blanched and cut by several incisions running obliquely down to the chin. The neck was cut through the skin and other tissues right down to the vertebrae the fifth and sixth being deeply notched. Both breasts were removed by circular incisions, the muscle down to the ribs being attached to the breast. The intercostals between the fourth, fifth, and sixth ribs were cut through, and the contents of the thorax were visible through the openings. The skin and tissues of the ab... So, yeah, it takes you a long time to put that together that that was a person, because it is so mutilated that you're, like, trying to find discernible features, and it's like, your brain's having to put together this gory ass jigsaw puzzle to see what you're actually looking at. So the intercostals are these muscles, as a lot of you may be familiar with anatomy on the side, the ribs right here. Um, so those were cut all the way through. So those muscles plus the cartilage that is in between there um, that supports you breathing. And that was cut all the way through to the point that you could see through them. So they could actually see through her rib cage. F fucking. What in the actual deep fried, lubricated, giggly fuck? 
abdomen from the costal arch to the pubes were removed in three large flaps. The right thigh was denuded down to the bone. The left thigh was stripped of skin, fascia, and muscles as far as the knee. On opening the thorax, it was found that the left lung was intact, but the lower part of the right one was broken and torn away. The pericardium was open below and the heart absent, unquote. So that was all from the post-mortem report for Mary Kelly. Um, everything had been removed basically like a game of, like a sadistic game of fucking operation. He split her open and took all these things out. And most of the organs and skin and stuff were like found around the room, again, in some sort of ghoulish fucking treasure hunt. However, the one thing that was missing was her heart. The pericardium, which is the sac that the heart is kept in, um, was cut open and the heart was removed. It was not found in the room. Yeah. Fucking ridiculous. Fucking ridiculous. Like, literally, like, yeah, it was, they said that her clothes, obviously, whoever she had up to the room, she was comfortable enough with that her clothes were neatly folded. You could tell this probably wasn't a frenzied attack when it first happened because she removed her clothes. It, it, it could have been removed under duress where she folded up everything and put them very neatly. Um, the reason they think that she was mutilated so badly was because this was also the only victim that was inside of a building. She was the only victim that was found not out on the street where somebody could walk by at any random given moment she was inside her own home. She was inside her own um, domicile. So he had as much time to do what he wanted to do when he wanted to do it. So he had literally all night and obviously no one heard anything, which is really strange. Not too strange considering the fact that with Catherine Eddowes, he slit her throat so deeply that there would have been no sound. So they probably wouldn't have heard a scream anyway, or maybe they heard the oh murder when he first grabbed her and then nothing else after that. So he could take as much time as he wanted. Nobody is, you know, except for that one guy who followed him around to find out what he was fucking wearing, you know, who wore it better, um, except for that nosy fuck. Nobody else was seeming to keep a peg on who went, came and went from her apartment or from her house, whatever. She was the only one that was found that was that bad. Eddowes was probably the second that was just like almost like Mary Kelly's here. Catherine Eddowes is here as far as like mutilation wise. Um, but he could take hours to do this and obviously did. With this final killing, the streets went quiet once more, and Jack the Ripper, whomever he or she was, walked off the pages of the Penny Dreadfuls and newspapers and straight into the annals of unsolved murder history. There are more than a dozen suspects in the case, and while no one was ever apprehended for the killings, it's safe to say that the curious incident of the Whitechapel murders of 1888 paved the way for countless serial killers after. So that was, boom, back to me. So does anyone have any questions? Jack the Ripper is probably one of my favorite. My favorite unsolved murder is Black Dahlia. Jack the Ripper is right up there. So I know a lot about the victims, a lot about the crime, more than I probably should. Um, they do also tend to escalate. Good point. Um, electric pagan they do tend to escalate with their murders and again given the time to do whatever you basically wanted to carte blanche to do all of the things you wanted to do to the other victims that you just didn't either get a chance to do because somebody came across you or somebody um interrupted what you were doing yeah so but it's weird and that's of course the the eternal question mark on the jack the ripper case was that if he was escalating, or she, could be, too, I don't know, we'll cover suspects in the next one. If he or she was escalating, why would you stop? Because, and um, most people that study serial killers, FBI agents, profilers know this, that serial killers don't stop on their own. They're, they stop when they are stopped, either 
by being arrested or by dying. So the working theory is that if the two following victims, which we can cover them briefly in the next episode, the ones that are like, we're not really sure if they were victims or not, um, that they either were caught for something else, that's the working theory, that he or she was arrested for an unrelated crime and went to prison, or they died, which was not uncommon at the time either. Mortality rates were pretty high. You died from very common diseases. So it's entirely possible that the person, perpetrator, suspect who was doing these things just got sick and died. And just that was the end of that. Uh, or he moved to another location. There is also a theory that he moved to America and continued to do what he did, you know, or went to another country. There's really no concrete evidence in that one. That one's just kind of like more like a little fan theory. Um, they can't really trace any other similar-ish crimes to that, in my opinion. Um, it's, it's, pos it's possible that he or she moved, but again, there's no distinct like, yeah, Electric Pagan. It's, theor it's theorized that it was H.H. H. Holmes, which is not the case because the dates don't line up. Like, none of the dates line up. Um, the MO doesn't line up either. So rarely do serial killers, once they have a preferred method of killing people, which it was prostitutes for him, that was his preferred victim type, and his preferred method of killing was stabbing, was cutting with knives. Holmes did not do that. Um, that was not his MO at all. So it's really rare for somebody to change their MO completely. Um, not, com not entirely unheard of, but... It's really, really rare. Um, good point. They did get DNA results off of the shawl and they were prepared to, so they found Catherine Edo's blood because big shocker, it was her shawl. And that was the piece that they found, the one piece of evidence that they ever found. So of course, most of my tri true crime people know this fact that when you start stabbing somebody or you use a knife as a weapon, uh, human blood is very viscous when you, it's slippery. And when you stab a bunch, the blood will coat the knife, coat your hand, your hand will slip down the blade and you will usually end up cutting yourself. So um, they thought that they might have found the killer's blood on this piece of the shawl when he wiped the, bl the knife blade. And it's true, they did find two sources of DNA. So they found Catherine Edo's blood and they found an unknown male assailant. So this one guy paid for all this testing to get done and he wrote a whole book on it and was like, we figured out who it was and we found his DNA and traced it back through ancestry. And it's this guy, they named Aaron Kuzminski, Jack the Ripper. Like they were like, we found out who Jack the Ripper was through DNA, blah, blah, blah. And then, <laughs> Guy stoked his, staked his whole fucking career on this DNA discovery off this rare phenotype that they found in the DNA. Turns out somebody was like, oh, shit, did we tell him that we made a typo? Oh, it was supposed to be a lowercase r and not a capital R. Shit. Um, yeah, about that book you wrote and the tours you're doing. Um, yeah, so you know when we initially told you that the DNA that we found matched less than 5% of the European population? It actually matches 95% of the population because we fucked up. So the DNA ended up being basically useless. So that was a fun discovery, and I'm fairly sure that guy probably wasn't very happy when he found that out because he spent a lot of money and basically, again, a whole career on like, we found out who it was. And then it's like, we didn't. Just kidding. <laughs> Whoop. That's true. That's a good point. Also, um, so Electric Pagan made a good point of like the handwriting was different maybe because he injured his writing hand. Um, that's entirely possible. Maybe he was writing it with the right hand because God knows I can't write with my right hand at all. It looks like a five-year-old wrote it. And I mean like a five-year-old who got held back a couple times. <laughs> like <laughs> not, not a smart one. Like one that has motor issues. Um, so 
yeah, he may have switched hands and was not obviously ambidextrous, but um, there also was the connection of the red handkerchief. I don't know if you guys picked up on that when I was talking about the, um, the first, um, I think it was either with Stride or Eddowes, which was the same night, obviously, September 30th. The way that the suspect was described, who was with either one of them, that was that had he, he had, he was dressed like a sailor and had a red handkerchief around his neck. Um, that's how he was described to authorities, which then fast forward to about a month later in October, when Mary Kelly is picked up by the suspect, which again, all match a vague, like, physical description it was a dude in a coat and he had a mustache and it was kind of short and stocky um about 25 to 35 he she said i don't have a handkerchief or i lost my handkerchief and he hands her a red one so it's entirely possible that this was the same person who uh killed stride and eddo's because of the handkerchief connection that's i kind of put that together and i was doing the notes and i went did I discover something and discover anything? I'm sure. I'm sure somebody else has thought of that. Yeah. This as well is injured by the knife. Yep. For sure. For sure. It's entirely possible. Or it, uh, it was entirely possible that he was fucking around and decided to cover his tracks. And I'm like, I'm gonna sound like a crazy person when I'm not a crazy person, or he was actually descending into madness. And it was like, I'm gonna kill everybody. I'm like, okay, dude. You need to have a seat and calm down. So part two will be next week. Um, there are about a dozen suspects. I don't know if I'll get to all of them just because that's a lot of suspects in one episode. I think I'll cover probably nine, nine or 10 of the major ones or the more popular theories um, in part two. So, cause there are some that I can just like rule right out that I'm like, yeah, no, that's just ridiculous. And, stupid we're not even gonna cover that one because it barely has any evidence nobody knows this theory blah so there's a few that i'm pretty sure i'm just gonna cherry pick out and then we'll cover the more popular internet theories even if they're wrong hh H. holmes <laughs> um or the more popular suspects so if any if no one has any questions if you missed your question or if you didn't get a chance to ask a question please put it below um, I will, I always make sure to answer any questions that you guys may or may not have. I try to be thorough, but I obviously can't cover everything. Um, also, um, please keep an eye out for the Dead Hours interviews on Paraflix starting March 21st, www.paraflix.com for those of you who haven't signed up or are wanting to go sign up or go check it out. The app should be out within a few weeks. Um, and will be available soon. I'll have at least four episodes available um, for your consumption at launch. Thank you, Polly, for providing the voice for Jack the Ripper for this episode. And if anybody is interested in being a guest on the Dead Hours for interviews, please email me below or you can hit me up on social media. I'm on all of them as the Dead Hours on Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. So if anyone has is interested or knows somebody who they would like to be on the show, if you have any suggestions, um, please, please, please don't hesitate to drop me a line because I do answer emails. I do get back to people who uh, message me. Yes, thank you so much for the voices. Thank you so much for all of that. Please go check out, um, there are two premieres this weekend so you guys have a couple days respite where you get to relax and have a good time until uh saturday unless uh the video gets 500 likes the new episode of haunted side victor hotel elevator of death that elevator was terrifying fucking terrifying <laughs> guys if the video gets 500 likes it'll come out early otherwise it is slated for saturday the new reality paranormals brand new episode farmhouse part two is going to be YouTube on Sunday. So you guys have a full weekend of paranormal. And then I will see you next week um, for part two of the murder corner, the suspects. Have a good night, you guys, and stay spooky. <laughs>